Great. So welcome to the CU's Computational Science uh, Working Group Updates webinar. I'm Scott Balavoni from Biogen, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. I think we have an exceptional panel, but before we get started with the presentations, I just have a few administrative items. Uh, so Q&A will actually occur after the presentations have been completed. If you have a question, um, you should see either a question functionality or some chat functionality in the GoToWebinar interface. Just enter your question into either one of those two interfaces, um, and we will address those at the end. You can feel free to enter those uh, questions at any point um, during the webinar. So as you just heard, the webinar will be recorded and made available via the FUSE website probably sometime either later this week or early next week, and that web address is FUSE.eu. So at this point, I will turn the presentation over to Chris Decker, a man that needs no introduction, for some opening remarks. Thank you, Scott. I assume you can hear me? Yep. Okay. I will show my screen just in a moment. So to provide a little introduction to what is what is Fuse? Uh, Fuse is a pharmaceutical user software exchange. Um, we celebrated our 10th anniversary this year, and our overall mission is to provide a platform for creating and sharing ideas and implementing tools and standards around data and exploring innovative methods and technologies. Uh, we're a group of programmers, statisticians, data scientists, all the people that touch data from collection through submission, uh, coming together in a, in, a, in a forum to share ideas and work on um, innovative methods and technologies for improving the uh, drug development and review process. So a bit of a paradigm shift, I think, in terms of the computational science collaboration. So I think in previous lives and years, um, one of the things that we've done a lot with various regulatory agencies and standards is we, we wait for a, a, a declaration from on high of, of things that we need to do in the industry from, from FDA and other uh, regulatory environments. And I think the idea, what we've sort of shifting to in this paradigm uh, and in other collaborations is more of a, a, an environment where we sit around a table and we talk about the issues and the, and the potential uh, benefits from new technologies or new processes and work together to come up with solutions, uh, whether they be solutions to fix issues or problems or gaps or new and innovative ideas that we might be able to tackle. So instead of throwing over the wall and, and, and giving us something to work with, it's coming together and coming up with a better solution. In terms of the computational science collaboration mission, um, and I won't read through all this, there's a lot of words on this slide, but the two uh, key things I want to focus on are the transparency of this initiative uh, and the non-competitive environment. It's people from academia, regulatory agencies, industry, technology, coming together to really support the product development and regulatory review process and come up with ideas for, for how we can improve and add to that uh, to be effective. So what is the computational science collaboration? Well, it's actually a simple, simple picture here. Um, the whole collaboration is really broken down into two components. The first is the symposium which we hold every March. And so we will having a symposium, a computational science symposium this coming March, uh, uh, in, in, in the middle of March, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. But then in addition, we have the computational science working groups. These are the groups that meet throughout the year uh, to work on these activities and, and to report back and develop things as we go along. Um, the working groups that we have put together have evolved over the last three years, and this will be our fourth year, uh, co fourth conference we have coming up in March. And they've evolved into these five groups that we have. The first is optimizing use of data standards, which focuses on the implementation of data standards. So we work very closely with the CDIS organization. Uh, they are in charge of and working on developing the standards, and we work on some of the challenges or some of the hopefully benefits and, and things we can do to improve the adoption and implementation of those standards. We then have a uh, non-clinical roadmap and implementation. So that's a group, a uh, very strong group, that's working on various um, implementation methodologies around the non-clinical space. 
and a roadmap to improve uh, the data and the communication in that area. We then have the standard scripts for reporting and analysis, which is focused on um, developing and working together to develop white papers uh, to, for some of the standard analyses, both within uh, certain therapeutic areas and across uh, safety and other other topics within uh, within a clinical trial, and then to develop um, standard scripts that we can use to report on on those white papers and analyses. Uh, the last two uh, were, event, were originally one group and have now broken out into two. We have a semantic technology group, which is focused at looking at semantic technologies to help with data standards, analysis results, and other areas. And then the emerging technologies, which is sort of an idea incubator, uh, the ability to, to generate sort of new ideas and new things that we want to uh, try out as we move forward in this industry. Um, all of those working groups revolve around a steering committee made up of industry and FDA uh, to focus on aligning these groups and making sure we're moving in the direct, right direction and, and managing kind of the communication with external uh, organizations. So what is going on? Well, there's a number of things going on. Uh, we have a few CS dashboard that provides an overview of active projects. So I'm going to jump off of this for just a moment. What you'll see here is our dashboard of ongoing activities. So these are the working groups that we have, and there are various projects that they're working on within those working groups. We also have a catalog of deliverables. So these are all the items that we've generated over the last three years, from white papers to the standard uh, study data reviewer's guide to references and wikis, where the SEND team, for example, is, is keeping track of their implementation challenges. Um, so there's a lot of information and deliverables that have been produced. And then we actually have another one we've added recently, which is our deliverables under review. So these are things being worked on now that we're sort of asking for feedback uh, as we go along. So there's a lot of work being done uh, within those groups. And you can go to any of those links off the FUSE uh, EU uh, website to uh, point you to where that information is located. Uh, we then have, as I mentioned before, emerging technologies. Um, we're we started this group in 2013 to really look at not necessarily tackling just the challenges we face, but also looking at new things that are coming down the road, new technologies, processes, methodologies that we might be able to use uh, to improve the, the, the product development life cycle. Out of that came a number of projects, the semantics technologies pro, uh, area, which as I mentioned before, that grew and had enough interest from, from volunteers and folk and, and other individuals that we started a whole uh, uh, group or another working group out of that activity. Uh, we had a standardization of metadata definitions and a lowering barriers uh, adoption of, of cloud technology. So there's been a number of projects that have come out of the emerging technologies. We're looking for new ideas as we move into the, the conference for next year. So we're looking for you know maybe big data transparency, other ideas that, that people might have about areas that we want to tackle. And I just asked everybody to keep their eyes open over the next couple months. We're going to be scheduling and organizing some idea roundtables, uh, virtual idea roundtables with about 15 to 20 attendees where we're going to try to generate these uh, new ideas. We have some questions and we're going to just have an open discussion so that when we go into the meeting in 2015, we have some ideas on the table that we can work on and move forward. So I've mentioned it a few times, but our Computational Science Symposium uh, will be held this coming March 15th to the 17th in Silver Spring, Maryland. Registration is open as of last week. We're going to have a number of activities during the meeting. Uh, we'll be kicking off with an FDA session where they'll be talking about you know, the, the impending guidance coming out, the FDA repository, how they're actually leveraging some of the, the Computational Science Working Group deliverables and other topics. And then we'll get into the meat of our meeting, which is really to focus on the working groups and having them break out and work on the activities which we've defined and, and, and have been working on throughout the year. So that'll be a large chunk of the meeting as we move forward. And then we'll have posters and an FDA panel at the end of the meeting to, again, have more open collaboration and discussion. So I encourage everybody to sign up early. Uh, the, we have a limit with the facility that where, where we have that to, to 300 attendees. Um, and it's already starting to, to fill up uh, very quickly, uh, and we just opened registration last week. So I'd, I'd encourage everybody to uh, sign up um, early for, for this event. It'll be, it should be a great opportunity to come together and, 
and collab continue to collaborate like we have for the last last three years. Um, and that's that's all I have. I'm going to hand it back over to Scott now, um, who will uh, will take it from here in terms of uh, our our next presentations. Great. Thanks so much, Chris, for that for the introduction. So we, as Chris mentioned, we are pleased today to have with us uh, Dr. Lily Rosario from the FDA. So I'm going to turn the presentation over to her and give her an introduction. So uh, Dr. Rosario is the director of the Office of Computational Science uh, in the Office of Translational Sciences at CEDAR. Uh, the OCS innovates tools and technologies and services specifically for drug product review and provides these to reviewers at the right time, backed up with training and support. So thank you so much, Lillian, for joining us today, and uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, and um, um, good afternoon to everybody. So if you're in the, on the East Coast right now, we're right after lunch, so I do hope that I'm keeping you all attentive. If you are on the West Coast, you should be all, you know, ready to gear and, and mid-morning for you. And if you're in the EU, I'm sure you're waiting for me to be done so you can actually go and have dinner. So I do appreciate everybody's uh, time and everybody's interest in this topic. Um, I want to talk to you about Jumpstart um, and how Jumpstart is actually uh, modernizing or transforming the regulatory review process here in the, in CEDAR. So I, I want to I want to tell you two things. Uh, I want to tell you who we are and why we're doing this. So by the end of this talk, I'm hoping that you take those two messages home and that you, you see how this is actually transforming our environment. So the first thing I want to tell you is that remember that anything that I say should not be interpreted to be policy or guidance on behalf of the FDA. What I do want to tell you is that we're super excited about this, um, this service and its impact on our regulatory review uh, community. So CEDAR has a couple of different offices. Uh, the Office of Translational Sciences is, is actually a super office in CEDAR that has three different offices underneath. Um, the Office of Biostatistics, the Office of Clinical Pharmacology, and the Office of Computational Science, and that's where we are. So this, the Computational Science Center is actually our service, our delivery entity, and this is where our service, uh, services are innovated um, tested and delivered for the reviewers. So that's who we are. Um, at the end of the day, we want to protect public health. And what we are trying to do in our office is find tools and services and capabilities that would allow our reviewers to actually increase the thinking time. That then leads to improvements in the way that we determine effectiveness and safety. And at the end of the day, we have products in the market that, um, that are safe and effective. So the ultimate aim is to protect public health. So we know that the mission for CEDAR is to have safe and effective products approved and in the market. So that makes our mission, the mission of the OCS in CEDAR, uh, one of supporting CEDAR and continually improving that drug evaluation and review process. And the way that we want to do that is by actually transforming, innovating, supporting the submission of high-quality data, and providing access to high-end analytical tools. We want to create services and deliver those, and we offer training um, to all of those aspects of what we're trying to do. So FDA receives product applications, so, you know, NDAs and VLAs. Uh, and the aim is to determine if these products are safe and effective before these products are marketed. Once the products are marketed, we also continue to take a look at them to make sure that they continue to be safe and effective, um, and we collect that post-marketing data. So <clears throat> when these applications come in, we ask our clinical reviewers, which are medical doctors, to actually take a look and tell us whether that data support the claim of safety and efficacy. But we're also asking them, at the very beginning of the review process, we're asking them to tell us whether, you know, there are data quality issues, there's any reviewability issues, um, and whether this data is actually going to serve them well in making those decisions about safety and efficacy. So according to the, the 21st century review timeline, which I'm showing you here, we're actually asking them these questions about data quality, 
review and um, and whether this is going to serve their needs during the first 45 days of filing. So we're telling the clinical officer, um, we're asking them, here's the data. Do you think this is going to serve you well for the rest of the review process? Um, so we don't think this is a very good way to do it, right? Because we're asking a clinical uh, person to make a decision about data quality. So, the, so we also recognize that over the last couple of you know over a couple of years, sponsors have submitted electronic um, submissions to the FDA in greater volumes. So we also know that the applications have grown in complexity um, as the regulatory science continues to evolve. We recognize that you know the workload at theater continues to increase. So there is an imperative to use standardized data. There is an imperative to actually leverage the tools that are intended um, to, to use that standardized data. And we also understand that there is a need to provide supportive services so that we can, at the end of the day, make those decisions about safety and efficacy as we review this product before they go to the market. As I mentioned to you before, we, we know that these reviewers are physicians, right? That, that was their training. So we stand by the notion that they should be spending their time figuring out the safety and the efficacy of these products. They should be spending their time thinking about the clinical implications of the data that they have in front of them. They should not be spending their time assessing whether the data they received from these clinical trials is actually of sufficient quality to support their review needs. They shouldn't be spending their time fixing the data while under the, under the review clock. They need to be thinking about the clinical implications. They need to be thinking about whether the data is supporting a claim of safety and efficacy. So I mentioned the standardized data, right? So um, we also know that the FDA houses the largest known repository of clinical trial data. Uh, and, that, and that repository includes you know, unique high quality data on the safety, effectiveness, and performance of both drugs and biologics. And we have this information not only pre-market, but also post-market. Uh, and, and if you've worked with any data at all, you know that when data is not collected in a standardized format, it makes it really difficult, um, and sometimes even impossible, to actually perform analysis on the data. So in, in 2010, there was a big initiative. Peter uh, Data Center's program was established, and, and their aim was to identify and prioritize data standard needs and to actually implement good practices for standards development. So since then, we have seen a significant increase in the number of submissions in standardized format, particularly you know, SCTM for clinical data. So, Given, given this need, so given that we have um, very strict timelines for a review process, and I'll show you what that looks like, the 21st century review timeline, knowing that the people doing these reviews are physicians and that they should be spending their time, you know, understanding whether the, the product in front of them is safe and efficacious, understanding that we have very particular needs here in theater. Um, that our applications are growing in number and complexity, that um, that clinical trial data, it, it, it's looked in a, in a different way. Um, given all those needs, we think that we have a way to affect that. So Jumpstart was created in theater in, in the Office of Computational Science to address this need. Um, and Jumpstart is actually capitalizing on the submission of standardized data. So what it does is that it provides the appropriate tools and the services to very quickly and efficiently run analysis that help the reviewers determine whether they have data that is going to meet their needs, whether they have data that is of high quality, that is of, of high quality, and it also provides them with exploratory analysis to really jumpstart their review process. So we are very excited and, and we are really um, understanding that this service is modernizing the way that we do review. Uh, because we have seen our medical officers using the service and really getting a, a very quick and thorough, um, a very quick uh, understanding 
or whether the data that they have in front of them is of quality. And that has helped tremendously in the way that they feel when they start um, their review process. So for us, Jumper is really a, a very good example of applying the right tools at the right time for the right audience. So what I want to do in the next couple of minutes is I want to take you through exactly how this happens, and I want to give you a couple of different examples of the findings that we've seen and how this has made a difference in the way that our reviewers are approaching the regulatory review. Um, if you want more information on Jumpstart, please visit our website uh, at fda.gov. Uh, under the um, resources for you, consumers, you should see a link for Jumpstart. So this is the timeline that I showed you before. So remember those 45 days of filing? Um, and, and I told you that our clinical reviewers have to make an assessment. Um, so it's not just an assessment on data quality, right? They also have to looking at, be looking at the science and whether these studies are actually going to support um, the, the safety and efficacy claims. But we're also asking them, you know, is this data of quality that you can work with it? Um, what is the composition of this data in, in, in relationship to these clinical trials? This is where Jumpstart comes in. So it provides a service that um, provides to the reviewers information very early on uh, on the data composition, on the quality, and analysis options. And actually, it provides, it gives them access um, to tools for analysis. So now our reviewers have the information to conduct um, an assessment of whether these products are safe certifications. So here's our jumpstart um, direct review. So we do very specific things, um, and I want to make sure that you understand the relationship of these things to what, how it impacts the regulatory review process. So um, what we want to do is provide the reviewers with an assessment, as I said before, of quality. But we also, what we're doing is that we're actually loading the data for them, in particular analytical tools, to ensure that they can actually load it. Because we have found that our reviewers were spending a lot of time just trying to load data. Um, and, uh, and at this point, we're making that technology very accessible to them. So instead of trying to fix the data so it loads, they can actually start working on it immediately and focusing on those more complex analysis rather than, you know, struggling with it all along with the data. Um, and also, we give them an assessment of whether the data will support particular analysis that they might want to run. So we're getting to the point in which you know if you have a product that you want to test for a very particular thing and you'll need a subset of the data. So we want to make sure the reviewers understand whether they're actually going to be able to do that. So four months down the line, when they're trying to do the analysis, they figure out that they actually, the data had a problem, and now they have to go back to the center and, um, and get it fixed. So we are identifying, actually, we're moving that completely to the first 45 days of filing. So now the reviewers can have conversations with the sponsor very early on when there's issues so they can be addressed. So as I said, we also load the data into the tools for the reviewers. Um, but in addition to that, we actually run automated analysis um, on what we consider universal or, or common analysis. And these include things like demographics and simple adverse events. And we, we think that this is very beneficial because, as I said to you, so they have the data loaded. Now we're running these more universal automated analyses, we're giving them to them. So we are shifting our reviewers' time in terms of now they can spend time doing those more complex analyses. You know, the ones that are going to go more in depth and tell them um, the possible risk benefits for these products. So we think this is a really important component. Um, and the last bit is that we provide analyses that highlight a specific areas, and we actually talk to the reviewers about it. So it points to specific issues that may be of, uh, uh, of concern or focus so that reviewers can go for deeper analysis. So we don't conduct the review, but we help them identify and highlight particular areas based on these automated analysis. And we say, you know, there might be an issue here. If you think it's an issue, maybe you can go take a look at it. And they actually 
decide whether this is relevant and whether they're going to look at it. So it's really shifting what our reviewers are doing. So when they, that review clock really starts, when they start, they get their application and they start to review, they are ready to go because they are certain that um, they have data of quality in front of them, or if not, they're working out how to get that data. Um, they have the data loaded into tools that they can use. We have provided on the site training for all those analytics. And they also get um, automated analysis delivered to them. So this is how it looks like. So the, the service has to the two major components, and they happen within the first 45 days of filing. So I will be referring to these two components um, for the remainder of my talk. So we received the submission. By week two, we provide them a data fitness assessment. And this is not just running a couple of different things. I mean, this is a thorough assessment of the data, and then we meet with the reviewers. We sit down in a team, and we tell them um, what, what, um, what the findings are, and we also help them uh, with language to communicate if there's issues with the sponsor. So we actually are moving those conversations with the sponsors to very early on in the review process. And then by week four, we provide them with this exploratory analysis that I told you about, um, the more um, uh, universal or the, the, uh, the additional um, analysis that, that, that we provide. So at this point, we also sit down with the reviewers and provide this information to them and have discussions about you know, the, whether this is relevant or not, and, and they take that information and include it into the review um, of the products. So we're doing that all around the clinical review template. So not only do, are we providing the information, we're meeting with them, but everything is organized around the clinical review template. Um, so, and the outputs that are provided to them as well. So if they decide to use it, they can include them directly into the, into the review. <clears throat> So here's an example of um, what we call what we call the top ten sort of uh, data fitness uh, checks that, that that we provide. And as you can see from here, you know, uh, a reviewer might see something like this. So you're missing the study data reviewer's guide. And by the way, I'll stop here for a second to give a shout to the views working group because we have seen uh, several product uh, submissions that came in with the study data reviewers guide that the Fuse Corp group put together. And um, the response has been very, very positive from the reviewers, definitely very positive from our teams in, in understanding that it's really conveying the information that helps the reviewers have a good sense of the data. So we're really encouraging uh, all of our applicants to well, definitely to submit a the study that a reviewer's guide, but also to fight to follow that um, template because it's very very useful. <clears throat> so another thing that you might find um, is having duplicates in your data. So, and that sounds really obvious, right? But when you're looking at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of data lines, it's very difficult sometimes to identify that that's going to be a problem. And you might find that out when you're doing an analysis for them four months on their line, but it's much better to, under, to be able to identify that issue very early on. Um, you know, the, the other piece that we have is in, uh, in, uh, non-standard lab unit or, or test names. So um, that really it, it has an effect on, on the review um, in the way that we do our reviews. And the other piece that is also very common is the misclassification of code. So this is just to give you an example of data quality issues that, that can be presented to the reviewers. So what happens is that we'll, we'll go through, we'll explain what is the relevance to, to these uh, checks, and they will decide what happens after that. So whether there's communication back to the sponsor for clarifications or for changes, or whether it's okay, we'll, we'll kind of work with whatever we have. So that's basically what happens. Um, I also want to tell you that when we do these data fitness assessments, we actually archive all of these reports. And what we do is that later on we go and um, we assess the quality of NBS generally. So 
So that way we can go back to the standard development organizations as the sponsors and say, these are the general problems that we see. So we find ways to start to address them before they come back to us as additional um, submissions. <clears throat> so I, I told you that there's this data fitness um, checks that we do. The other piece that we do is that we check conformance against the standard. And as you know, the uh, preferred standard for um, clinical data is the SDTM. So we need to ensure that the data that we receive follows the format of SDTM. So we want to be very transparent. And at the end of the day, what we want to do is we want to have data that is of high quality for our reviewers. So that way, we can have it very effective and efficient reviews. So what we did is we published our, very, our FDA specific validation rules. So if you go to our website, on the data standards, so for industry under data standards, you will see that we have put our uh, validation rules in there. So it is our intent to continue to update these rules as we gain more experience um, and, uh, and, and to keep you in the loop for these things. So the way that they show is in human readable format, and the advantage for this is that they can be adapted or used in any one of the validators. So all the rules um, that we are considering at the moment have been published. So I encourage everyone to take a look um, to this, um, by following the address to this website. So, um, the last bit of the data fitness component that I want to tell you about is that, um, so I told you we looked at those data fitness assessments, and we also look at the conformance to the standard. But it doesn't stop there. We actually go and do a manual look as well. Um, and, and we found very important information by doing that manual look. Here's an example of coding quality. So, you know, the coding quality is, is something that we do um, all the time for our um, data fitness assessments. So here's an example. The case report uh, form is showing the finding as loss to follow-up, right? When they coded the data, they coded it to other. What it should have said, it was that it's loss to follow-up. Um, you know, another, another example. You know, patient terminated because glucose levels were maintaining a high despite medication. So they decided that this should be coded to other. Was the reality of it, it should have been coded to lack of efficacy. Um, and and I, we see this more often than I would like to admit. Um, it, death during the study period was coded to other. Well, it should have been coded to death. So, and you get the point, right? So you can go through. So we actually do that manually um, because this helps the reviewers. We don't tell them how to change it. We just say you have these inconsistencies. They decide what that means, right? They decide what the translation, whether the coding that was associated with this case report form is what it needs to be, and whether that impacts the way that, um, that the assessment happens for them. So this is um, what our data uh, pieces are doing. I want to give you just very three quick examples, very simplified about job search findings too for data fitness. Um, <clears throat> and again, very simplified because the way that I'm going to show them to you right now, you know, there's a couple of lines, but when you're looking at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lines in the data, you know, this can be very difficult to spot. Um, mismatch data. So here we have two arms, two regimens, um, same subject. So where are they supposed to be in regimen A or regimen B? So this is something that is important to, to figure out early on. Um, and here's another one, misrepresented data. So we capture information about that in two domains, both in the demographics domain and the adverse event domain. So I'm thinking this should match, right? And, and the last um, one that I want to show you is the duplicate of missing data, because I already showed you the misquoted data. Um, here it is. You have a lab domain, and it has lines and lines and lines and lines of data for each subject. Well, we have the same subject, and the data is repeated. Obviously, your means are going to be skewed, and this is going to be a problem. So understanding that this has happened is really important for our reviewers early on so they can figure out what to do about it. So these are all of our examples um, on the data fitness 
portion, which we think are really making a difference in the way that our reviewers understand their data at the beginning of the review process, and the way that they can now communicate with the sponsors about these problems so they can be addressed early on. So I told you there were two components to Jumpstart. The, the first one was the data fitness, and now this is the exploratory analysis portion of it. So we deploy several analytical tools uh, to conduct this um, exploratory analysis. And you know, we include things like assessments on demographics, disposition, adverse events, laboratory findings, and bioscience assessments. And what we do is we index all of these um, results or these uh, analysis to the, as I mentioned at the beginning, to the clinical reviewer template. So we feel that by providing this targeted exploration, jobs are really enhancing the efficiency of safety signals um, and, and identifying uh, the risk of particular findings. And this really has a direct impact uh, because at the, as I mentioned, at the end of the day, what we want is safe and effective products out there. So we're shifting that time. We're saying, you know, these analyses are giving you a glimpse at issues, possible issues. Now, the reviewer can go directly to those and say, is it an issue or not? And then, does it have an impact? What are the implications to clinical safety and efficacy? So this is where JOSAR is really making a difference. <clears throat> so I, I've told you about all these analyses. Um, and you can see very, seem very overwhelming, right? But we sit down with our reviewers. Uh, you know, those two sessions that you saw there are actual meetings with the review um, team in which our staff sits with them and go through the results and, um, and translate when there's questions and also talk about the clinical implications. So these tools are really enabling our reviewers to perform you know, comparisons um, and start to look at the safety profiles. But it also allows them to now have that basis and then go drill down to events and patients of interest. So, you know, we also perform very specific data exploration, um, and we highlight that that really highlight certain tools' unique capabilities. Um, we provide the reviewers with analytical our analytical methods, so they understand exactly how these findings are, are are created, and we also give them the tool output. So everything is provided to them for the use. So this is. This is how we think that Jumpstart is really transforming the scientific regulatory review process. So by interpreting data quality checks, um, performing a large number of these safety analysis up front, you know, orienting our reviewers to the outputs and tools, having those conversations, actually setting up the data for them um, so it's readily available and there's issues that they can care of and also providing all those training um, resources, uh, it's really getting our reviewers to be ready to go the minute that uh, a decision to file the uh, application uh, happens. So what are we doing next? So we find that there's a lot of benefits for what we're doing, and our reviewers are really uh, finding that it really helps them. So based on, on, on research availability, uh, availability, so what we want to do is we want to extend the Jumpstart service. Um, we, we know that it, it does have a potential, a big potential in the theater community. What we're also finding is that this service is really an effective test bed for those new tools and, and the new technology. Um, and also to help us determine the best practices on how do some of these um, safety questions can be addressed. So we're hoping to continue the service, to expand it, and, to, uh, and to, to be able to offer it to more of our theater community. So as I mentioned to you, we're, we, tar we targeted the clinical officers, which are the clinicians that are looking at the, at the data when it comes in. Uh, so our service was implemented to support that, that, that clinical piece. So what we want to do is also look at some of the other portions of the review uh, and address those needs as well. For example, you know, the clinical pharmacology or the, uh, the farm talk section, 
um, they offer great potential for us to look at uh, to see if this way of looking at the data would be helpful to those disciplines that we're actually looking into that. <clears throat> so here, um, I just wanted to show you this because this is how um, we we put together all the information about Jumpstart for our reviewers. Um, this is where they come to actually request the Jumpstart service, and they have announcements, and they're actually the their outputs, as you can see, um, are available, and they go to a place where everything is organized according to the clinical reviewer template, and they, it gives them a place, one place, where they can come and they can have access to their data. So I also wanted to tell you that um, we received accolades for this service. People have recognized that it is making a difference. So in this past July, we were very, very honored to receive the to be named as Secretary Pick um, by Secretary Borrell at the HHS Innovate Ceremony. So it was very exciting um, to be able to be part of the the uh, the ceremony, but also to be honored as a Secretary Pick. So we we're very happy about that. Um, it also gives us an opportunity to really be able to talk about it some more in, in within the theater um, and outside. So that was that was really really nice. But you know the most satisfying accolades really come from the reviewers because then you know that you're doing something that is making a difference. So we've heard many, many testimonials about the benefits of Jumpstart. I just picked a couple of them just to give you a sense of the flavor of these. You know, it, it, you know our reviewers were really feeling that, you know, that Jumpstart helped them with getting that familiarity uh, with the submissions at the filing meeting rather than a lot later, right? It also translated into them being able to have conversations in advance of the mid-cycle meeting. So now we're moving the whole entire process um, to be more efficient and effective. Um, we've heard things about, you know, overall understanding the quality of the data, um, but also, you know, looking into those safety signals and having um, a sense of what those are very early on. You know, full confidence in the data. I mean, I don't think I ever heard that before. I was I was really excited to hear that, you know, to to know that our reviewers are going um, at, to the review with full confidence that the data in front of them is actually meet their needs throughout the review cycle. Um, you know, I told you about the the coding um, manual coding assessment that we do, and uh, you know, understanding that you know reviewers are appreciative of that that look. Uh, of whether the uh, AEs uh, coded are following what um, are representing the data in the correct way. So, uh, you know, these are the very exciting findings. Um, we're very excited that the, our reviewers understand and appreciate the service this way. So, you know, as I mentioned at the very beginning, the OCS is a service organization. Our mission is to support CEDA in um, in our regulatory reviewers. So. The reviewers are telling us that this is making a huge difference. So we're going to keep doing it, and we're going to keep doing it to the best of our abilities. Because at the end of the day, what we want to be assured is that you know our children, our parents, our friends, our loved ones, always have access to safe and effective products. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Lillian, for that excellent and informative presentation on Jumpstart. That was, that was very, very helpful. Uh, you're welcome. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, the questions, we will take those at the end. So if you do have questions on Lillian's presentation, please uh, enter them into the question window in the um, CoTo webinar interface. So we'll now uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about a uh, deliverable from the Optimizing Use of Data Standards Working Group, that a recently released white paper on best practices for assigning visit num for unplanned visits in SETM data sets and assigning EPOC for all subject level SETM data sets. So I will now turn the presentation over to Trevor Mankas to walk us through that. So when he gets set up, I'll just give him a brief introduction. So Trevor is a senior statistical programmer at Shire who has over seven years of industry experience implementing and practicing CDIS standards. He is an active member of the CDISC Adam committee and currently working on a sub-team focused on the development of a new data structure aimed at standardizing occurrence data. 
He's attended the annual Computational Science Symposium in 2012 and is actively engaged in working groups and authoring white papers related to best practices for implementing CEGA standards. So Trevor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Scott. Um, yeah, so, so as um, Chris Decker spoke earlier during this uh, webinar, um, this, this, this is actually one of the papers that is out for public review right now. Um, it's, it's the result of, you know, a, a few months of uh, our smaller team, our smaller working group meeting, um, you know, every, every so, every few weeks and, and coming, you know, coming up with ideas and uh, challenges that, that we found uh, relating to this topic and then coming up with recommendations and, and best practice uh, guidelines. So, um, you know, I have a link here on the slide to the Fuse Wiki. Um, obviously, it's you can't click on it, but the, the, the short path is underneath if you just want to write that down or take a screenshot. And also a link to the white paper. And again, comments are actively being accepted until December 31st, uh, till the end of the year. Um, if you do have any comments, we're asking you to go to the Fuse Wiki and add them to the Discussions tab, um, if you can. Alternatively, you could also email me your comments and I'll post them on, on your behalf. Uh, and my email will be at the end of the slides. So, um, as I said, uh, our sub-team, our smaller team, has been working since last year's Computational Science Symposium in March to prepare this white paper. Um, and our goal from day one was to develop a set of recommendations for best practices for defining, deriving, and implementing visit nom and EPIC on a subject level. Uh, seems pretty straightforward, but there there are some challenges involved, uh, especially when you get to some of the more complex situations and, um, you know, scenarios that you might come across with uh, dirty data. Uh, again, because we don't live in a, in a perfect world, we don't always have clean data all the time. Um, and then within our team, you know, we, we formed smaller sub-teams which kind of focused on individual use cases that we put together. So we had some people focus on VisitNum, some focus on Epic. Um, and then come up with challenges and solutions for those. And just a disclaimer here, similar to what uh, was said earlier, uh, the opinions expressed in the slides and the white paper are those of the authors, not representing opinions of FUSE, FDA, CDISC, any other organizations or companies. Um, it should not be interpreted as a data standard or anything like that. Um, so the challenges that we came up with, uh, the first is basically for VisitNum, how do you, how do you assign VisitNum for unplanned visits uh, so that they sort chronologically, especially when you have partial dates and missing dates. Um, you might also have some unplanned visits which occur on the same date as a, as a scheduled visit date. Um, so we're going to get into some use cases on that. And then for, for EPIC, um, how to assign values to that. Uh, for all observations in, in the data sets. Um, again, that can be challenging when we have a, another partial or missing date um, or where the, the observation that you're actually trying to assign an epic to falls outside of a planned element in your trial. And I'll get into specifics for each one of those. Uh, so first we'll focus on VisitNum. Some, some additional background on that for those who are familiar with the SDTM implementation guide, you would know that there's two options provided for populating VisitNum. Uh, the simpler of the two is just to assign the same value, uh, for example, 99, to all the unplanned visits, regardless of, of when they occur. And um, again, this is easy to do, but it doesn't provide any sort of uh, differentiation between the planned and unplanned visits in, time, in terms of chronological, you know, events. Um, the alternative, which is a little bit more challenging, is to um, slot those unplanned visits into the other data for each subject and, and assign a one-to-one -one relationship for visit, non and visit. Um, again, so that when you do sort by visit, it's uh, providing an accurate representation of when the events occurred for that subject. And those are, those are outlined in more detail in the SDTM implementation guide. 
section 4145. Um, as a reminder, this is from the implementation guide as well. Visit may be left missing from planned visits, may be populated with a generic value, uh, or individual values may be assigned. For the purpose of this white paper, we, we chose, uh, we agreed as a team to just leave it missing. Um, but again, this bullet is just outlining that there are options. Um, and then for, for our white paper, we assume that an unplanned visit is um, synonymous with what most people call unscheduled visits. So any data collected outside of the schedule defined in your study protocol. And we're assuming that any planned uh, data collection at a scheduled visit would be, would be entered into the correct place in your, your data collection system. So we're dealing strictly with unscheduled data collection. Um, so our team, after meeting and discussing, uh, we recommend that if possible, we, we go with option two, the more challenging implementation, um, because it, it provides a more accurate representation of the subject's uh, experience throughout the study. We're also suggesting that we leave visit missing for the planned visits. Um, again, that's really sponsor specific. You could choose to populate that if you'd like to. Um, we're also suggesting that we, the, the nomenclature for visit num for, for slotting them in chronologically is to, to increase the values by 0.1 or 0.01, whatever's needed, um, from the previous anchored scheduled visit. So for instance, if you had a, a week six scheduled visit that was visit num equal to six, and then an unplanned visit a few days later, we're suggesting that you assign visit num to 6.1 so that it sorts afterwards. Um, we're again uh, suggesting that we don't impute any partial or missing dates in STTM. STTM should be data as collected, so any imputation should be done downstream in analysis. Um, partial unplanned dates, the visit num should be assigned uh, based on the chronology of the, the known parts. This is one of the benefits of the ISO 8601 date format is that even if you're missing, you know, pieces of a date, you can still um, pretty easily sort chronologically and, and get, uh, get to where you need to be for this. And we're also saying that if it's not possible to determine where a record falls uh, chronologically, then we uh, go back to that generic value that was in option one where we just say everything gets bucketed into 99 um, if you can't determine chronology. Uh, this, this seems like a lot, but I will go into specific examples, so just, just kind of bear with me if you can. Um, the next recommendation we have for multiple unplanned visits um, if you do have multiple unplanned visits which can't be sorted chronologically and do get that generic identifier, um, it, it, we're suggesting that we do similar uh, algorithms. So 999.1, 999.2, et cetera, et cetera, as needed. However, if there's only one uh, unplanned visit, then uh, an integer of 999 or, or whatever your generic value is, is would be fine and the, the decimals aren't need, necessary. Um, and then when we talked about this a lot as a team, um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to public comments on it, but we also talked about when the unplanned observation date is the same as the planned visit date, we have basically two approaches defined in our white paper. Um, again, we can increment the visit number by 0.1 from the scheduled visit, um, just like we talked about. Um, the alternative is to um, renumber visit num and visit to, to match the scheduled visit that it occurred on uh, and then flag it as an unscheduled record in like a supplemental qualifier um, to identify, you know, those unscheduled visits from the scheduled ones in the raw data. So I'm going to go through each one of those use cases and if you've looked at the white paper, um, this kind of goes along with it. We have these examples, and then each each one of these broken down. 
and discussed in more detail. So if I'm going too fast, you know, you can always refer to the white paper and and uh, make comments from that. So the first record that I've identified here is from the lab data set, uh, row number seven. It's originally collected as an unplanned visit, uh, unscheduled labs, and it occurred on the same date as the week two labs were drawn, 2013, May 27th. And in order to differentiate these two, we sorted by date um, and assigned the unplanned visit to a visit num of 2.01. And in the SV domain for SDTM subject visits, we populated the unscheduled visit description variable SV UPDES with descriptive text showing which domain um, this data came from. So you'll see that on row number four in the SV table. The next example is uh, labs row eight. Uh, it's a similar situation where we have unplanned labs drawn on May 29th, um, which is between the, the, the scheduled visits for week two and week three. And so we've assigned a visit number of 2.02 .02 because it, it's a few days after that previous unplanned visit, which we just talked about. So it's showing the incrementation as you have multiple unscheduled visits uh, between uh, scheduled visits. And again, we populated the unscheduled visit description in SB with some descriptive text. Uh, the, the next example is row 10 in labs and row 5 in the ECG table. We have an unplanned uh, visit that occurred on June 3rd. It's the same as the week 3 visit date, so a scheduled and unscheduled that have the same date. And in order to differentiate um, between the two, we've assigned visit number as 3.01, similar to the first example here. Now here's a situation, it's lab row 12 and uh, subject visits row 8. We have unscheduled on June 10th, which is the same date as a week 4. And this is showing that um, per our last recommendation, you could, you could remap the unplanned data collection to a scheduled visit. So we've had it a week 4, visit number 4, and we've added a sub LB with an unscheduled flag equal to yes. So that when the two uh, parent domain, when the parent domain and supplemental qualifier merge together, that that variable is there to indicate that it was in fact an unplanned visit. We also have another unplanned lab uh, lab collection on in June of 2000 or July of 2013, but we don't actually have a day. But what we do know is that it falls between week four, which was in in June and follow-up, which was in August. And so even though we don't have a full date here, it's a partial, we can still slot it in between uh, week four and follow-up, and we've given it a visit number of 4.01. So that's showcasing that we don't always need full dates. We can have partial or missing to get there. Um, labs row one and ECGs row one. We've had uh, unplanned visits, unplanned labs, and ECG data, um, and the, the date itself is completely missing. So this was this was just data that we don't know where it fell, and we gave it a generic value of 999.01. Um, and then in SV, we populated the unscheduled visit description with ECG and labs just to show that it came from those domains. Um, and the reason we gave it a generic numbers because, again, since we don't have a date, we don't know where it falls. It could have been anything from screening up to follow-up. So to be safe, we put it as a generic 999. And similarly with, with this example, um, we do have a partial date here. We know that it was in May, but we had a lot of scheduled visits that occurred in May from screening to week two and we don't actually know where this fell in May, if it was between screening in week two or, or week two and week three. So since we're not able to definitively say where it belongs, we gave it the generic number of 999, 
and incremented it from the previous one, so we have 999.02. So that SV table at the bottom should be a full representation of this subject's visit data throughout the entire study, and it kind of gives a, a more clear picture of when the unscheduled visits occurred and what they were for. Uh, this next example shows an unplanned labs which occurred um, in between two scheduled visit dates. So we had screening that spanned from, from May 20th to May 25th, and somewhere in between there we had some unscheduled screening assessments done on the 23rd. And while we followed our conventions with this, we made it 1.01, .01, we wanted to add it as an example to point out that now in SB, while sorting by visit num, it's actually giving us some some funky looking data down there because we have we have screening from the 20th to 25th, but then an unscheduled at the 23rd. So it's not chronological um, in this case because it occurred in between a, a windowed collection. Um, we'll can move to Epic now. Um, so the background on Epic. The FDA um, has two documents out that talk about the, the importance of EPIC. The, the draft, I think it's still draft, the Study Data Technical Conformance Guide and the CEDAR Common Data Standards Issues document. And in both of those, they discuss how EPIC should be included for every clinical subject level observation. Um, and then in parentheses, they have adverse events, labs, con meds, exposure, and vitals. However, we recognize that due to challenges associated with implementation, it's not yet a requirement. So that's what spurred this, this topic for us was difficulties in implementation. So uh, our team, again, discussed this, and we have some proposals which we've written down. And we came up with the idea that EPIC can be assigned using uh, two methods um, in combination with each other or one or the other. But we've identified using visit num and visit as, as a method and also the date of the record, whether that's for findings or intervention and events or usually a date associated. So we can use visit when we know, based off of the value, um, where that visit falls in terms of study design. Um, for instance, you might have you know a missing date, but the visit is treatment period one. Uh, day one, and so based off of that, you, you know that EPIC is probably going to be treatment if that's the values you've defined. And then using dates is pretty straightforward, just like we just like we uh, we normally do. But I'll go into examples again on the coming slides. Uh, we also recommend that we don't worry about including EPIC in historical data type domains, especially medical history, um, where it's assumed that all data that's represented occurred prior to the start of the study. Um, again, you, you normally wouldn't have anything in medical history that occurs on study that would be an adverse event or something like that. So there's no benefit that we saw in, in including EPIC in that domain. Then the team started discussing, you know, what happens if we have data collected at an unplanned time in the study? And we, we realized, you know, the implementation guide talks about this unplanned elements that we can define. So if you're not familiar with that, um, I'll give you some background. Basically, any period of time that is considered unplanned should be represented in the uh, trial elements domain and subject elements domain as an unplanned event. So the value of the unplanned event description should be populated with why, what that unplanned element is, and uh, if the T, A, E, T, O, R, D variable is included, it should be left to null for those unplanned elements, again, because it's not planned. So um, using that idea, we can, we can actually place those unplanned uh, assessments into an unplanned element uh, in subsequent epic. And again, I'll go into examples with that. Uh, similar to, to visit num, we don't we don't want anyone to do imputations on partial or missing dates. Again, that should be left for analysis. If a date is completely missing, 
and you can't determine when where epic falls based on visit num, then epic should be left to null. Um, you know we don't want to we don't want to just assign it a value if we if we don't know what it is. That's misrepresenting our data. Um, when we have partial dates, we we can try to assign epic based off of the chronology of, of what we do know, and I'll I'll show you that on the next slide. And then we also suggest, and this is actually still open, I think, for for discussion with uh, the FDA. But we we discussed as a team that if we have a a record which could possibly be in a treatment element, uh, treatment epic or a non-treatment epic, but it can't be determined which. The most conservative approach would be to assign epic to the treatment phase. Um, however, you know, obviously it's best to discuss that discuss that with your review division and uh, make sure that it's documented well in the reviewer's guide. And so here's an example of uh, a trial. We have a run-in screening period treatment period, followed by a washout, followed by another treatment period, and then a follow-up, and then some sample subject data. And so uh, the vital signs, row number two, we have a, a date of, of missing, no date at all. But if we look at visit, it says period one, day one. And so if we know our trial design well enough, and looking at the diagram above it, we can safely say that that falls into period one, epic, if that's what we've defined our epics as. Um, row number 10, it's a similar situation where we have no date and it's an unscheduled visit, so we don't actually know where it falls. So we've decided to leave epic completely missing since we have absolutely no idea where that record actually should be. And then looking at adverse events, row one, we have a partial AE start date in April 2013. And if we compare that to um, all the other data for that subject in our SE domain, we see that anything in April must be in the run-in element um, based off of the dates because we have a start date of April 1st and a stop date of May 1st. So it's safe to say then that that AE, which started in April, was during that run-in epoch. AE row number three, we have another partial start date. This one occurred in May. And if we look at, again, looking at the SE domain, May of 2013 uh, spans multiple elements. So it spans screening, uh, actually running, screening, uh, period one, and even washout, and a little bit of period two. Um, so we've decided to assign an epic as period one because uh, again, from our recommendations, if, if you're unsure if it occurred during a treatment and a non-treatment epic, we've decided to be conservative and make it treatment. And again, that one's open for discussion still. Um, and a similar situation here, we have uh, we have an AE start in June, and that one could be either period two or follow-up, and we've decided to go with period two. The next example is um, pretty simple. It's, it's basically um, showing an... A, an adverse event which occurred um, after the follow-up period had ended. So if we look at the subject visits domain, follow-up ended on May 14th, but we have an AE reported as a start date of April 1st. And so we decided to handle that by creating an unplanned element in the SE domain, which you see in row number four, and um, we've provided an unplanned description of after study discontinuation with an epic of post follow up and that's what we that's what we gave the value in uh, AE. So you'll see the AE record which occurred after follow up and the epic is post follow up. And that was the best uh, solution we could come up with for that. So in summary, um, again, I encourage everybody to go to the wiki, download the white paper, review it. Um, if you do have comments, again, they can be posted up until December 31st. Primarily, we'd like to have them posted under the discussions tab on the wiki. Uh, if you have a, a wiki account, uh, username, um, you can log in and do that. Alternatively, you could email them to myself and I'll post them on your behalf. Um, and I think that that's it. So thank you for your time.
and I'll hand it back over to Scott. Thank you so much, Trevor. That was really helpful and very informative as well. So we actually have received quite a few questions. So in the interest of time, and I, with apologies to Han Ming, I think we are going to delay that presentation to our January 2015 webinar and kind of walk through some of the questions. So we have questions for, uh, for Lilium and for Chris and uh, a couple for, for Trevor as well. So if we, if we don't mind starting off, um, Lilium, there's a question that came through about uh, the validation rules. So will the FDA be updating the validation rules for SCTM version 3.2? And what are the FDA's plans for accepting submissions in SCTM uh, version 3.2 as well as the therapeutic area user guide data set? So um, thank you for the question. So the answer is that we are, are planning to update rules um, uh, as we go along. So this first pass re really was intended to, to tackle the fact that we really didn't have any specific, you know, FDA specific validation rules. So we will be doing that. Um, so the process for versioning uh, SCTM is the one that the Office of Strategic Programs has proposed, which is um, the website is updated when we are um, accepting that particular version. So I encourage um, you know, participants on the webinar to just keep an eye on that website because then you'll know uh, when we'll be able to start accepting the particular version that you're interested in. So sort of related to that question, is there a mechanism to provide the FDA with feedback on the validation rules? Um, I mean, we always have, I think there is a, a way to do it through the website. Uh, there's an address in which you can provide feedback. Uh, I'm wondering when you say feedback, what do you mean? Um, unfortunately, the presenter did not, or a questioner, a uh, person asked oh, okay. a question. You know, I would imagine it would be something if there was um, a question about maybe your interpretation of the rule or perhaps something that maybe violated yeah. the SCTM business rule. Yeah, I, I, again, I think I encourage folks to follow the same mechanisms that they have in the past, either through that website. Uh, at, you know, that um, provides all the information on the data standards and the versions that we are accepting, or the other pro the other way that we've been getting those questions is through the eData um, uh, address in which applicants, as they are um, submitting applications, they have the opportunity to ask. Okay, perfect. And then uh, just another question, that is, that is there a plan to have the Jumpstart service available for non-clinical send data? I am really hoping that we get to that point. I think we, at the moment, we are really looking into, you know, what are the pieces that we, will be most useful, and and seeing whether resource-wise we can implement something similar. But that would be the idea. Okay, perfect. There are some noted implementation challenges in the FDA Common Data Issues document with element and element, element and element code. Was it intended to speak to those challenges, or only of the two variables epoch? Um, at the time of our uh, CSS last year, we we were only uh, uh, tasked with the challenges of uh, visit num and epoch. We, we didn't we didn't take on any work to do with um, element code or element. But you know, if if that if there is any uh, implementation challenges there, it could certainly be suggested as a as an upcoming topic for another working group or for our working group after this. As it relates to, to EPOC and visit um, is there you, you should present a, a few methods. Is there a preference within that the project of one method over the other? Um, I, again, so what we've done in our white paper is really just come up with what what we've discussed as our team as as a best practice. Um, and I know that for um, for for visit num there was two options, and for Epic um, there was a few methods there. Um, you know, obviously, this isn't rule, right? It's just a white paper, so it doesn't govern anything or anything like that. It's just kind of a reference so that if you do find yourself having challenges with implementation, you could look at this white paper and get some get some ideas or, or guidance. That being said, um, you know, I would divert back to those two documents I mentioned, the, the study data technical conformance guide and the, the common issues document. and um, you know, try 
to include EPIC in your data sets. And also for, for VisitNum, you know, if possible, go with that more challenging method. Again, if you read the implementation guide on that page, although they provide both options, I got the feeling, at least when reading it, and other team members did, that that second option is, is obviously, you know, more comprehensive. So I think that would be more preferred. Okay. So it seems as though we may be having some technical difficulties. So I think we will stop the webinar here. And for those who have uh, posed some questions, we will follow up with the presenters offline. And I would just like to thank everyone for attending the webinar and for the presenters for uh, providing this information and providing this presentation. So again, thank you for everyone for joining the webinar. And we will have one another one in January. Thank you.